Hi, I'm Linda Mal, and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit The Modern, and our interviewer, Rachel Livdalen, speaks with the artist Cause about his exhibition, Cause, Where the End Starts. Now for Art This Week. Rachel Livdalen here with Cause at The Modern to talk about his exhibition, Where the End Starts. Thank you so much for talking sure. with us this morning. My pleasure. Um, first off, can you tell us what types of works are in the exhibition? Um, the exhibition is a sort of gathering in the last 20 years and it sort of it, you know, shows drawings, schematics like different product drawings to paintings to sculpture and um, pretty much everything that, that I've done. You know, even in the front of the museum is some of, some of the objects, um, commercial objects that I've created. And so you started your career as a street artist inspired by graffiti and working with public advertisements. Um, I don't know if you call graffiti a career, but yeah, I was doing graffiti when I was younger and that uh -huh. kind of led into street art mm -hmm. and what they call street art at the, at the time really wasn't a label. And then eventually into working on canvas and sculptures and product design. And so what what drove you specifically to work with the advertisement images? There was a point in the early 90s, like in around 93, where I, I painted over a billboard uh -huh. and it was more about just the location and just getting the work in a very visible spot. But then I started to, when I was looking at the picture, you know, in graffiti a lot of times you just have the picture in the end because things are ephemeral and they disappear. And um, I was looking at the picture and I just started to think about how the parallels with graffiti and advertising and sort of the fight for space and communication to people and reaching people and mm -hmm. I also like the way the ad put the work into a sort of a timeline and mm -hmm. you identify it with all the other ads that you're seeing at the moment and mm -hmm. um, it just became interesting and I started to explore it more and more and that led me into working over the phone booths and bus shelters and mm -hmm. things like this. At that time who or what were your influences? You know, it's as it is now, they were all over the place. You know, I had this sort of older generation that I was looking at that kind of did what they did in the 80s in New York. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, when I was in college, I was real doing real oil painting. I was looking at Bouguereau and mm -hmm. Jerome and Sargent. And, mm -hmm. You know, and then with the toys, I mean, when I first started making toys, I was thinking a lot about what the pop artists were doing with additions and, you know, companies like Gemini would do stuff mm -hmm. with Oldenburg and Wesselman and it's just that I was living in a different, in a sort of a different sphere than the art world, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had this understanding and appreciation of this, these things, but I just saw toys as a way of creating my first objects mm -hmm. rather than, you know, a traditional edition with a gallery or something. After working with the advertisements and the, the photographs in which you painted on top of the imagery, you moved on to um, cartoon imagery. And so why the shift? How does working with cartoons differ from the advertisement images? You know, cartooning, cartoons are just another visual language. It's sort of like actors that don't get old and they populate the world. I mean, I just when I got out of college is when I first left the country and started traveling. I went to mm -hmm. Germany and to Asia a lot and I just realized within all these different cultures there's these people and they were growing up on the same things I grew up on. You know, the language could be different but they understand, you know, mm -hmm. like, dope is Homer Simpson. It's just, uh -huh. it's a, it just became fascinating how imagery and these objects can just coexist in all cultures. You know, Mexico City, you go into the markets and there's little pinatas of SpongeBob, and it's. I just, I just really liked to sort of feed off that imagery and how, mm -hmm. how I can kind of inject my work into it. So there's a lot of different pop cultural characters within the work. We see The Simpsons, we see Snoopy, SpongeBob. You mentioned. How do you select the characters that you work with from all the cartoon narratives that are out there? You know, it's. It's not really important to me, the narrative. Uh -huh. um, it's more of just a visual thing and sort mm -hmm. of how I felt or how I kind of came into the, the characters. Mm -hmm. So some things I tend to, you know, that have been around me since I was little and some things are new and mm -hmm. sort of unknown to me. And when I'm painting, I'm thinking more about painting and composition uh -huh. and 
um, the color. It's just, it's not mm -hmm. so much like, oh, I love this episode. And when you're in your studio working and drawing from these different characters, do you, do you tend to stick with a certain character for a number of works, or do you bounce between characters? It's not, I'm, I'm, I'm not like held to anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I pull from a lot of different, the way I create paintings, like the one behind me is, um, uh -huh. you know, I, I have hundreds and hundreds of images redrawn on the computer mm -hmm. that I've just, in this program called Illustrator. Mm -hmm. And then I, I sort of assemble them almost like a collage. So I'll just pick from things and it doesn't really matter where it's coming from, whether, you know, some of the planks in the other room or from mm -hmm. like the exploded barrels from, you know, 1940s UBI works. And mm -hmm. so it's, yeah, it's, it's almost like a collaging. So in his exhibition catalog essay for this show, Michael Offing states that, quote, cartoons are the closest figurative equivalent to abstraction. And I wonder if you have anything to add to that statement. Yeah, I mean, you look at, I guess because I've worked with sort of contemporary identifiable cartoons, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you can't get away from it when talking about the work. But, you know, when I look at so many other paintings in history, whether it's Picasso, I just see, mm -hmm. you know, cartoons and they're sort of dealing with the figure in a cartoon way. And yeah. I think it's, it's just a different way of, you know, approaching something and it, just how it comes out. So if it's color and flat, it, it's automatically gets characterized as cartoons. And so, but you've moved on to working with acrylic paint. Um, how does that material influence your work when talking about um, kind of the romantic oil paintings within <laughs> art history, but then bringing in yeah. almost like a printed material aesthetic, almost like a screen print flat? Yeah, I mean, I, I approach a lot of the paintings kind of almost the same process as you would approach creating prints, mm -hmm. um, but they're all hand done. There's no masking, mm -hmm. it's just freehand. Mm. And it's, you know, it's just understanding what, what kind of the steps are to creating a painting, what colors can go over other colors, what, mm -hmm. you know, how, how, what you need to construct the image. Yeah. Um, I kind of obsess about painting, but I know in, in the sort of world we exist in, it just, a lot of the stuff you can look at it and assume that it's graphics and printed and mm -hmm. all those different things. Did your time in Japan or experiences Japan differ um, from working with American culture? It's one of the same. I mean, the world has been condensed so so much in recent. I mean, at that time in the '90s, there wasn't you know social media and stuff mm -hmm. the way it is now, or at least not as strong. But um, I think the period that I've kind of grown up within, you know, you've seen this all change, and there isn't you know if I release something, whether it's in Japan, Hong Kong, Korea, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. it just is universally seen mm -hmm. within minutes. You know, it's not mm -hmm. it, so I. I don't think it matters where, you know. I, I learned a lot from going to Japan. I really, yeah. there's a sensibility that I appreciate about, you know, the craftsmanship in Japan. And mm -hmm. my first store, my only brick and mortar store was in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we opened that, I think, 2006. And wow. that was a great experience. I have a lot of appreciation of the mm -hmm. country, but as I do all country, you know, mm -hmm. like and any place you go new where you're stuck into a, a place where you have to kind of learn the culture, I think it's fun for me. How does working with the physical characters in three dimensions influence your work in the paintings? You know, sometimes you just, I don't know, you, you just sort of see things, you see your work in a new way, and you start to think of, you know, how this can apply, but especially with the, the acrylic sculpture like Key It's Alone, mm -hmm. it's the first time where I can actually pull directly from what I would do in paintings. Mm -hmm. and, use some of the same files as a form, but this way we can make it so you can see through the sculpture. You can walk around it instead of painted shadows. There's real shadows from the different layers and the way it sits within the plexi. And you also work on very different types of scale from the handheld toys to monumental public sculptures. How does your sculpture change when working with those different scales? I think the approach is the same. You know, when I'm making a toy, it starts with a small maquette, and the same mm -hmm. thing if I'm doing a 30-foot sculpture, mm -hmm. it's the same. It's the same clay maquette, and that we digitize and scale up. And um, I think the, the relationship to the viewer changes because you know, where you're used to having these toys, you can hold in your hand and. 
place around your room on your bookshelf. Suddenly, you, you can be confronted with this thing that can hold you in its hand, and mm -hmm. I don't know, it just makes you sort of like feeling different mm -hmm. around the work. Besides scale, another interesting feature of the sculptural work is the materials you choose to work with. Um, for instance, wood or plastics, or even painted bronze that appears like plastic. Uh, could you discuss how you choose the materials for the sculptural yeah. works? I mean, I, I feel like when you have the sculpture, the material get, you know, once you see the form, it sort of mm -hmm. directs you in what it should be made in. And, uh -huh. Um, I enjoy, you know, I, I like learning about this kind of why you make work, you know, you want to explore and you want to learn and so as soon as you figure something out it can lead you into like, alright, so now what can I do next and mm -hmm. um, so that's why I like to work on a lot of different materials and sort of get a better understanding for them and mm -hmm. you know, how one can sort of strengthen the other. We see some of these repeating characters and um, I'm wondering if, especially the monumental figures in three dimensions, if they have a story behind them or a background. Um, do you envision storylines for I the characters? I don't. You know, I, I mean, it was one of the things that I kind of realized at one point and, and appreciate about the work is that there is no, there isn't a narrative mm -hmm. to you know. If anything, it's just they're more about like my current moods or how I feel about what's going on in the world around me mm -hmm. and how I feel. You know, in, in the, traditionally you, you would think of a sort of more cartoon form as this proud or mm -hmm. happy sort of image. And, you know, I like to add more of a human touch to it. Mm -hmm. so I think that's kind of why, you know, people respond to them. So when talking about toys and even art, the idea of collecting comes up. And do you consider yourself a collector? I mean, I like, I definitely like collecting things. I, you know, I understand the process. I, uh -huh. I appreciate the process. I'm, I could be obsessive about certain things. Um, but, yeah, you know, I think, I think it's fascinating, you know. It's one of the things I really liked about Japan when I first started going is that you have, like, these young kids who are connoisseurs about the things that they collect, and mm -hmm. it's not necessarily art, and, but everybody assumes, you know, art is the, the sort of, you know, people in the art world are, feel very great about their knowledge about collecting, mm -hmm. but, you know, I feel like it's all the same thing. I feel like, you know, that person who's the expert in these small ceramic, you know, cups or something is just as interesting and valid as, as anything. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I like the fact that a young kid can walk into a museum like this mm -hmm. and have been living with my work for, you know, 15 years mm -hmm. and understand the, the sort of chronology of the work and what came first. And, uh -huh. you know, it was, it was really funny when I first started showing in galleries, there was these, you know, like, like kids would come in and know more than the staff of the gallery. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I like that. It's, it's not how I grew up. I always thought of galleries and museums as sort of this sacred, weird place, you know, especially like contemporary galleries in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. You felt like you were shoplifting or something. <laughs> so. Yeah, it can definitely sometimes be a cold place, which, yeah. which leads me actually to my final question for you today, okay. um, which is that you have a large fan following and a very wide audience, um, including those who don't normally frequent galleries and art museums. And so knowing that you have this audience how does that influence your studio practice? I mean, the work I make, I make for myself. It's, uh -huh. you know, it's just sort of what I need to do mm -hmm. in my mind. You know, it's not, but, you know, you do realize that there, there is an audience and there's certain ways that you can get the work out there. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, not every artist is interested in social media. I tend to like it. I feel uh -huh. like it's a fun sort of free dialogue with people, you know. Growing up, I'd look at the artists ahead of me and there was like a lot of smoke and mirrors and a lot of sort of like guarding of information and how an image is out there. And, and I just know I don't want to be that. I want to be, you know, yes, you can, you can come to a space like the Fort Worth Modern and, and see this exhibition, but you can also, you know, see pictures of like my kitchen <laughs> on Instagram or mm -hmm. my, my, you know, whether what we're up to, what we're eating, mm -hmm. you know, I, and it's not in 10 years will I regret it, possibly. 
but um, but I just feel like it's where we're at now, and, and I should just try to be honest and open. Well, thank you so much sure. for spending some time with us and talking sure. about the work. Thank you. We want to thank Cause for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to themodern.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polo.